Hi everybody, it's Jim Skelly and this is the ninth of our mini lectures in the spring semester of 2011. I want to start tonight by talking to you about uh, some geopolitical issues. The first and most obvious it has to do with Libya. Um, as I think everybody knows, uh, the United Nations authorized um, a, an exclusion zone uh, so that, uh, and also the protection of civilians um, by coalition forces, uh, and, and so those attacks have begun. Um, yesterday, apparently, about a hundred plus cruise missiles were fired at various Libyan installations. You should be aware that each of those cruise missiles costs over $500,000. Now, why are we so concerned about Libya? Well, you know, we ostensibly were concerned because of uh, uh, the uh, madman Gaddafi uh, uh, attacking civilians who are uh, the citizens of Libya. Um, but you want to ask yourself if that's the case, if that's the primary reason, would we be doing the same if Libya didn't have oil? One of the things you have to recognize, and if you've been looking at the course material on peak oil uh, that, you know, sometime in the last week or so you should take a look at, um, you want to then think about, would we be concerned about Libya if it didn't have oil? Um, uh, just a couple of facts and figures. Libya uh, has um, the greatest amount of reserves in Africa of oil. It has about 3% of the world's supply of oil, uh, and a number of countries depend quite heavily on it, certainly in Europe. Um, and so, you, of course, you have the French and the British in particular taking the lead in um, uh, calling for military action against Libya. Um, it is a situation worth keeping your eyes on, because economically, you know, oil is selling right now at around $110 a barrel. Now, the cost of oil, if it were to go, say, to $200 a barrel, probably all of the economies uh, that uh, operate in our societies would go into an extraordinary nosedive. So oil, energy, is terribly, terribly important to or the economic well-being of the rich countries of the world. Now, um, one of the things to, to know about, I, I only figured this out a couple of years ago, how many gallons are there in a barrel of oil? Um, it's actually 42 gallons, or about, in other words, about 150 liters. Um, it, costs a, you know, it costs a lot more by the time it gets to you and me. Uh, but that's the basic price when you're actually uh, looking at the market for oil. So keep an eye on this because it could get um, could get quite messy. And um, uh, the United States is trying to play a somewhat back seat, uh, uh, take a back seat approach to this. But I think it's going to be a very very difficult situation. Um, and this ties, at least in my mind, to the, the broader issue of our use of energy. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you have been uh, keeping an eye on the Fukushima nuclear plant disaster. There seems to be some progress. We would hope that there is some progress. But there's a very interesting article, and I'll post the link to you, and by George Mombio, who is a leading environmental activist and writer, <clears throat> Uh, George wrote an article in the Guardian newspaper, and uh, what he's saying, I mean, he's, he has been historically an opponent of nuclear power. And given this disaster, you can see a lot of people saying to themselves, I don't want nuclear power. And, you know, as I pointed out uh, a few days ago uh, in the last mini lecture, we may live, some of us, or work 
close to um, close to some of the nuclear uh, power plants that have the same design as the Fukushima plants. Um, and you do have to worry about uh, the safety of nuclear power. George Monbiot, however, has taken a different approach, and I think this is interesting. I think it's worth reading his article about this. He says that he, what he's really worried about is that if we don't have nuclear power, worse things than a nuclear disaster may occur based on the fact that various countries will shift to using coal. And he finds and makes a very strong case that uh, although the death toll from certain nuclear disasters is, you know, a hundred people or something like that, um, there will be millions of people killed as a consequence of the human-caused climate change, of which one of the primary uh, uh, culprits is the use of coal for energy. So it's a very, very important argument to take uh, take a listen to, and uh, I'll send you the link on that. Now, a couple of other things. One of the um, <clears throat> many of you um, may have seen um, uh, the film that we posted on the website uh, called Home. It's by the photographer Jan uh, Artus Bertrand. Um, and he has created a new uh, website um, in which he's trying to get us to be conscious of our distant cousins around the world, essentially. Um, the website is called Six Billion Others. And part of what he's trying to do, I think, is break down our stereotypes and find the commonality in humans across the globe. Um, and there are short interviews with people. And uh, I mean, he's, he's done a fantastic job of putting all this together. Interviews with people from all over the world, very short, uh, asked a couple of questions. And what one gets is a sense of how much we all have in common with each other. Now, um, contributing to, to uh, uh, our sense of each other, I think, uh, or, or what should be contributing to our sense of each other, is how we individually live on the planet. Uh, and Chris shown us the other day uh, on created a course forum called uh, Zero Waste, and she references a zero waste home in California, where they just don't have trash where they keep um, you know, very limited amount of clothing. Uh, and this is a middle-class family. But what they've done is, is to really, really move down, not in terms of the quality of life, but in terms of the amount of stuff that they have. So you might, I'll post the article as well as, as uh, urge you to contribute to the uh, course discussion that Chris started, okay? Now, um, a couple of other things. One is the um, another story of uh, inspiration. You know, um, Renji Butelid in, um, in Hungary uh, posted, and again, this is one of those things I wish you would take a look at. So take a look both at uh, Chris's Zero Waste and Renji's uh, course discussion that he started called Perhaps a Dose of Inspiration? Question mark. He quotes or posts fully the commencement speech that the environmental writer Paul Hawken gave a couple of years ago. And everybody that's read it, including me, comes away inspired. And there it just is no question that I think you will come away inspired. So go ahead and take a listen to that as well and, uh, you know, post your own comments. A lot of people, it seems, from the class have passed on this uh, particular post uh, because they have found it so inspirational. Take a look at that. Now, um, there's another story, we talked about it last semester in the class, and I want to talk about it again 
now, but in a different way, because there is, unfortunately, another disaster in the works. Um, ten years ago, uh, there was a, a ship that went aground just off Cape Town, South Africa. And tens of thousands of penguins, were African penguins, were um, put at risk because the oil was coating, uh, coating them. And what happened was that large groups of people came to save the penguins. Towards the end of this class, towards the end of the semester, we look at the phenomenon of human empathy. And what I'm struck by, by what was characterized as the great penguin rescue, is the fact that that rescue and 40,000 penguins were saved by humans who went to extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary effort to clean the penguins so that they could swim once again and, and uh, uh, not die as they would have died without human intervention. It's the best of us, it seems to me, when we do things like this. Unfortunately, um, and w one of the people who was involved in the Great Penguin Rescue, and I'm going to send you a, a book review about the book that she did. Uh, her name is Diane DiNapoli. And Diane is the penguin lady. I'm hoping to interview her for this class and post the interview in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, but Diane is now known as the penguin lady, and she wrote a book about the Great Penguin Rescue. Uh, she sent me an email um, today saying that uh, there has been another disaster on a, um, a very remote island in the South Atlantic called Tristan da Cunha. Tristan da Cunha has about 250 people living on it and it's a long way from anywhere. It's about 1750 miles from the nearest land, south of, which is South Africa, and over 2,000 miles from South America. So if you're thinking in kilometers, close to 2,000, uh, sorry, close to 3,000 kilometers from South Africa uh, and uh, around 3,300 kilometers from South America, right? A very small island. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, even smaller islands uh, as part of the, the, uh, the larger territory of Tristan da Cunha, uh, but it is known to be the most remote inhabited location on our planet. Now, what has happened is that a Greek freighter, right, and, I mean, this is just a horrible story. A Greek freighter, right, somehow, you know, here's this, these isolated islands, and somehow, uh, a Greek freighter, 75,000 tons, which is pretty big. I was on a 25,000 ton oil tanker many years ago. So 75,000 tons is three times that size. Uh, and it's breaking up on one of the islands of the uh, Tristan de Cunha chain. And needless to say, once again, thousands of penguins are being covered with oil. I'll send you some links to those stories. There are more than penguins are at risk. There are other rare birds living in the most isolated place on the planet. And uh, um, they, they expect tens of thousands of birds to die as a consequence of this. So take a look. Um, let's hope that it's not too bad, that somehow there's some phenomenal change. Uh, and that these birds uh, manage to survive in significant numbers. But this isn't good, and once again, it's a ship at sea that has caused enormous damage. Okay, I'll be in touch again next week. Uh, I've been very pleased to see that discussions with regard to the learning circles, I know some of you have had difficulty putting together a proposal. Uh, you've got about uh, four more weeks now, a little less than that, to... Uh, to put together uh, your final learning circle um, projects. 
but I think the big pro the big part of the process is actually defining what the proposal is. Now, once you've done that, you should be able to pull it together and get it to us by the 15th of April. I hope all's going well, and don't hesitate, as I always say, to be in touch uh, if you want to talk about any aspect of the course. Thanks very much.